I would say really like, you know, 90% of birth is so, um, is so spectacularly mundane, right? It's just like the body just knows what to do. And, and there's this pulsation that comes and, and, and moves with a woman's body. And then the baby comes out. And then there's this 10%, let's say, where you really are aware that that entry point is a, is like a kitchen door that swings both ways, that birth and death. And that there are some births that really get into that, um, that liminal space where it's like, it really, there really is a potential that this baby might not make it. There really is a potential that this birthing person might not make it. Welcome back. Welcome back to the podcast. It's been a long, long time. It really has. It really, it's been too long, far too long. You are one of the special people in the world who does birth and death and everything in between. And mm-hmm. you um, just have this, this sort of vibrance about you. And we had been throwing these ideas around as to how we can get you back into the show. And fortunately, you just took some interesting new training, which I'd love to talk about related to Tantra, which I think is mm-hmm a really great, when you understand what Tantra really is, it it provides a lens through which to view almost everything. We're not just talking about like penis and vagina, cervical orgasm. Like that's, that's, that's elementary level Tantra. We're talking about <laughs> the sexual and the and eros. And I, I'll share a little bit of some of my new insights, but um, for starters, remind everybody you're in birth and death. What the heck does that even mean? What does that look like? Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> um, Well, as these things go, you know, personal becomes professional, becomes personal, becomes professional, life becomes art, art becomes life, and they just mirror and reflect back with each other. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's been the case for me. I originally in my early 20s had an interest in maybe more in death and also in sex and, and, and exploring my, my own sense of sex, my own sense of pleasure and, and who and what am I? And am I homosexual? Am I heterosexual? And, and trying to you know, explore those things for myself. Um, so that was sort of in my, in my teens and in my early 20s. And then in my mid 20s, I had the tremendous fortune of connecting with and meeting Ibu Robin Lim in, in Sumatra in Indonesia. Indonesia she's, yeah. yeah, she's a famous midwife there whom, who of course I didn't know that when I met her, I just, she just was a midwife and uh, well, just a midwife <laughs> and she, in, yeah, she invited <laughs> me to gosh, a birth. Very, very unusual. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So she invited me to a birth and it really just transformed my life. Um, it was the birth of twins. And, but of course, but we didn't know that she, she hadn't been seeing this wow. person for prenatal care. So out came a baby and was needed deep resuscitation was, was really in that liminal space between birth and death. Um, and then the laboring person was still writhing in pain and, and seemed like they were bleeding, potentially hemorrhaging. So Ibu Robin had asked me to then 
um, place my hand on her stomach and see if I could massage, which at the time, you know, I didn't even know what a fundal massage is. Of course, sure, you, sure. you and I would know that intervention now. But when she did that, I felt something firm and, and said that out loud, I, you know, so, 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 so something's there. <laughs> it's either a boulder or another baby. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know. So then, you know, and so in, in between doing resuscitation, she's like, what do you mean something's there? And just quickly reached her own hand onto the woman's abdomen and then realized, oh, God, like, oh, Got the almighty, there's another human that's going to join us. Um, so that was about 18 years ago, those two, it was twin daughters and those two daughters, um, have made their way to, I believe, nursing school in Jakarta and plan mm -hmm. on being midwives themselves. So it's like wow. a super beautiful wow. story. Yeah. Well, um, but basically, you know, how did, so how did birth and death come to be what my personal and professional life is focused on is, um, you know, I think like chance and fate. So as you know, it's not possible to be a birth worker and to also not have some exposure to death, either in um, miscarriages and um, late miscarriages, fetal demise, full term yeah. demise situations. And then, of course, a lot of our work working in obstetrics and hospital systems then exposes us to a tremendous amount of near miss experiences for birthing people. And so, so, so that element of death is really a part of birth work. And then um, I was working as a labor and delivery nurse and teaching birth doula workshops on the side in my early twenties and really enjoying that. And then I felt the need to take a break from that work. And I started working as a hospice nurse and realized that so many of my skills as a, as a birth doula and as a labor and delivery nurse were very translatable yeah. to the end of life. And then I just haven't stopped. And then it just, <laughs> everything's been, been weaving back and forth. You've woven this incredible tapestry of the life of Nicole. Hybrider. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love hearing, I mean, I have more friends of mine or acquaintances are midwives probably than I ever would have expected. And almost mm -hmm. all of them that I become, you know, with whom I become very close have this unusual perspective on death and dying as well, where it's not like suddenly you're not afraid of it. It's that you have this different relationship with it. It's like something Absolutely. now to be to be this conversation that unfolds for the rest of our lives. If you're paying attention, I wouldn't say all labor and delivery nurses or midwives or um, doctors of any sort, uh, but if you're paying attention, there's absolutely, I mean, the, it is this, it, it is a very, very similar experience sitting with these incredible transformations. So it's no surprise to me whenever somebody like you, you're highly intelligent, highly, highly thoughtful, um, and you're open to change that you're, that, you know, fate has kind of, woven this path for you, which I think is very beautiful. And I'm sure it serves you uh, remarkably well in both of those different, you know, distinct fields, which is really one in the same by having it, both experiences. It really does. And I, I, I love what you're saying about the, if you're paying attention, because that, I think that's the thing. I, I can feel myself getting emotional just thinking about it. You know, that's the thing is that um, I would say really like, you know, 90% of birth is so, um, is so spectacularly mundane, right? Yeah. It's just like the body just knows what to do. And, and there's this pulsation that comes and, and, and moves with a woman's body. And then the baby comes out. And then there's this 10%, let's say, where you really are aware that that entry point is a, is like a kitchen door that swings both ways that birth and death and that there are some births that really get into that um that liminal space where it's like it really there really is a potential that this baby yeah. might not make it there really is a potential that this birthing person might it's not sort make of it being alive yeah like yes yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is not off the table yeah yeah, yeah. 
And I, and I think for those of us sensitive and, and aware and open physicians and midwives and doctors um, and nurses, that it's, it's nearly impossible sometimes to be in a birth room and to not get that feeling on the back yeah. of your head of like, oh, I, f- I feel that presence. Like I, I, yeah. I feel that there's something else here and that this is not a foregone conclusion of which way this baby is going to go. Yeah. Yeah. I want to run something by you real quickly. Um, and that is this word I've been grappling with, which is safety. And in, in, a, in a, what you might expect is, is a very controversial opinion. Um, everybody always talks about birth being, you know, it's safe, it's safe, it's safe, it's safe, it's safe. Well, let's, let's, let's go to death. Is death safe? <laughs> is the dying process safe? I, I don't, I don't know how to answer that because this is like where my curiosity lies. But if we were to say death is a natural process and whatever comes afterwards is just the process, the same I think can be said for birth. But what I've realized is that when we use the word safety around birth, what we mean is you're you're probably not going to die. Fortunately, not too many women, even in underdeveloped countries, do not die in childbirth anymore. Thanks to, you know, septic techniques, to blood transfusions, antibiotics, whatever. But I've also grappled with this reality that when you're sitting with birth, something changes. And like you said, if you're paying attention and you're, you're aware, your, your sense, your, your sensibilities are heightened, you notice that something changes. And what I've realized is nothing really changed. What happened was something died. There was a leaving of something. So we talk about births bringing life in and death stuff going out, but in birth, something is leaving. That's actually the feeling that I'm starting to I'm starting to come around to through meditation and whatnot is that feeling that something magical happening is actually a dying process in birth. Now that doesn't mean the mom and baby are dead. That is not what I'm saying. But then back to the word safety, and this is where I kind of want to get your opinion. Is there anything safe about dying if we equate safety with not dying? No. So why does why do I push back now on this term safety in childbirth? It's because something is dying. And anytime you are transforming from a out of the chrysalis into a butterfly, there is a death process. There is something that is being left behind. So if we are to only to equate safety to death and dying, sure, childbirth is safe. I am trying to push this forward a little bit. And here's I would really love your your perspective here. There is nothing safe about any sacred transformation, whether it's a psychedelic journey, it's being born and ultimately having to die. If, if death and, and, and safety are, uh, or, or safety and, and not dying are synonymous, then there was nothing safe about being born in the first place. So we have to kind of scrap this language. I'm really curious about what your thoughts are. If I were to say there is nothing safe about giving birth. Yeah. Well, I, so I would agree with that, but in the realm of the psyche. So I think that what's happening to the birthing person is that it's so physically intense, physically disruptive. And there is this psychic feeling of, of it's a, it's a feeling and a fear of, I'm not going to make it through this. But I think both, both of us have, have been you know, a witness to it's, it's, you know, it's, it's in particular for first time birthing people and in particular for first time birthing people, when they're around that seven to eight to nine centimeters mark, oh, they yeah. kind of, you know, will look and say like, I think I'm dying. I may not go through this. And You've heard what, it a hundred times. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and this is, you know, sort of what I teach in my birth doula trainings and what I feel like I try to talk and promote is like what a difference it would be in our world if nurses and doctors and midwives and doulas were right there holding that person's hand saying yes let yourself fucking die let all of who you used to be amen be released you don't that person really no longer exists as this new human is coming through your pelvic bowl in through your vagina and, and pushing out those old cellular patterns, those old neural pathways, you do become a new human being. And so not only does a birthing person give birth to their baby, but they're really giving birth to themselves as a new individual. I love that so much. 
there's our quote for the uh, for the episode right there. We, we don't even have to have any more show. I'm, d- I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, this is really, I think, where it's at with transforming our relationship with birth. You know, we're so afraid of our yeah. mortality, the end of our life, so to speak, that uh, when we're confronted with similar feelings around mortality, maybe for the first time ever, a woman is being faced with mortality right there. There is no looking away. It is everything all around you. You're passing through this portal and there is no turning back. That, that must be a very similar feeling to the death and dying process. And it starts with being reminded of your mortality with like a cancer diagnosis or whatever else. Suddenly you can't look away from it. You can't drink your way out of this. You wake up the next morning and bam, it's back mortality right there. I, I think that this is really how we can shift uh, I think the maternity care system really would benefit from this language because, yes, you your old version is dying. Yes, there's a new new version being born. It's not bad. It's not good. This is just life. This is the transformation of spirit that you were that you were brought here for in into the Earth School. Um, even if it even if the language is a little bit confronting. So for anybody listening, we are not saying <laughs> it's not safe. You're going to die in childbirth physically. What we are yeah. saying is that there is something being left behind. Yeah, and there's a psychic. Totally. Yeah, it's totally. a, it's a shaman. Totally. It's a shamanistic process, mm-hmm. and that that's you know my belief about birth is like birthing people were the original shamans. They get into an altered state of consciousness. You know, now we, our friends, you and me, we're using holotropic breath work. We're using psychedelics. We're using other modalities to help us get into yeah. that. And birth is really one of the biggest ways that people get into that altered state of consciousness and experience a psychic death. And and what I think is is you know somewhat interesting is that there's so much popularity of psychedelics, and and also then really beautiful practices around this concept of like yeah you are going to have a feeling prob- potential, potentially at that peak of the ayahuasca or the peak of acid, peak of psilocybin, where it feels like, oh, it's like too much. And ideally, a good facilitator, what do they do? They say, embrace it, go back to your breath, breathe into it, dive into it. Yeah. So I feel we do have realms where that embracing of of the of the psychic death exist. It just hasn't infiltrated into the normative culture of birth and hospital settings, unfortunately. Yeah. And I mean, of course we can't blame the people that don't resonate with this language. They have been conditioned into a system. They've been trained, especially doctors to work within a system that only really cares about those physical metrics that we know are important. Death. Absolutely blood, you know, blood loss, infection rates, NICU admission rates, like that's what all the studies look at. That's what everybody looks at. So if we're only looking at those metrics, yes, childbirth is safe in the home for many women. Yes, it's unlikely you're going to die in the hospital. Yes, even having a C-section, you're probably going to be just fine. But what if we were then to start peeling back these other layers, the immeasurable layers? That's where you and I, yeah. I think, I think we, we're, we're comfortable where other people may feel a little a little icky. Absolutely. And if I may, if I may um, say this about us, I think, I do think though, that we're having the right conversation. Because if you look, if you look at national surveys, like listening to mothers, um, some of the work that Maureen Corey and the um, Lynn Paltrow, the National Partnership for families, I'm forgetting maybe the name of their organization, so forgive me. Um, But they did these national studies, uh, listening to mothers, there was listening to mothers one and listening to mothers two. There's also, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's also Eugene de Klerk out of, um, out of Boston, who does a lot of research. And of course, Hensi Goer, who's been just, you know, um, um, a visionary on these topics, but you know the reality is that in those national surveys, it was roughly one third of birthing people, at least in America, um, felt that their births were traumatizing to them. Mm. So, you know, our medical system can be focused on the measurements, but as a society, eventually, we're going to have to be focused on 
why are we not supporting people more spiritually, emotionally, and um, from a heart-based way of their process of giving birth and welcoming new fellow human right. beings onto our right. planet. Right. Yeah. I mean, to, I think that what we're describing here is abstract because it's becoming, it's coming from the, the experiences that we've had. But even if we look at the modern hospice movement, you know, Cecily Saunders started this in the UK. When was it? The fifties or something, sixties. Mm -hmm. And she had a term. This is really what, what emerged within the hospice and end of life care sort of, uh, um, dare I say it, the medicalized way of doing that, at least us trying to take what we understand about physiology and, and, and imparting it onto families and, and people who are dying. This concept of total pain took not only into account the nociceptive neuropathic, the pain, when you think of pain, I've got a iron on my face that hurts. That's physical pain. But then you also have the psychological, the emotional, the existential or spiritual pain. And when we start to step back and look at death and dying as all of these components of just pain, just that element of this process, existential pain for those who don't know is what's going to happen to me after, you know, after I die. I mean, there's a lot of suffering around that. And we use a lot of medications to, to help people cope with that because their physical pain starts to become worse but they're actually really the, the, the crux of their issue is this spiritual pain. So they start emotionally coping with opioids and it just becomes so more complicated than just pain, give a pill, pain, give a pill. What if we were to transplant that and superimpose birth onto that total pain, just looking at physical pain in childbirth alone? And granted, yes, I'm a man. I've never given birth. I have no idea what it feels like. But having sat with so many people, including my wife, there's far more here than just the merely physical pain. There is all this other stuff, the existential pain of what's going to happen to me when I step through this portal. I know, I feel like I'm dying. I feel like the molecules are being pulled apart. And what happens when shoom, everything comes back together and now I'm a mother? That's where the medical system starts to hit a dead end. But hopefully people yeah. like you and you can start to <laughs> move the needle just a tiny bit. Yeah, absolutely. And I do... I could be naive in feeling this way, but I, I do actually see that 10 years in the future, there will be more conversation and more dialogue about this because you and I both know that our, our birthing system, our labor and delivery units are in a spiral. They're in a crisis. They're the, the, you know, the nurses are burnt out. The physicians are burnt out. They're, the midwives are burnt out. Midwife practices are finding it more and more difficult to, yeah. to find true collaborative practices. Um, we, you know, I think you and I both know that our, our the, the portion of our lives that is the maternal health industry is truly in a state of crisis. And while, of course, that's it's painful to, to know that, and it's painful to have, of course, you know, so many people that you and I love are so deeply affected by that. So I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to seem like I'm just only being um, hopeful about the future. Like I, I, it is very painful right now for, for, I think for all birth workers in different realms. Um, but I think that that is only going to lead to some kind of reset. That's like, okay, well, we can't, you know, we cannot just expect providers and nurses and midwives to just be emotionally destroyed and cut off and yeah. Yeah. and made to behave like machines while they're welcoming new human beings onto the planet like that just it, that just can't keep happening that way yeah. so i'm hopeful that there is like some kind of reset that's that's going to happen but i don't but i don't know you know I, if you would have asked me 17 years ago like you know i I was I was back in New York City and I was working with all these radical midwives and doulas and doctors. We were going to create the first and the only independent birth center in Manhattan and was, you know, like, yeah, it's going to happen. And then it didn't. And I thought, you know, just so many things that I've in these years have worked on that I really thought like, OK, like it's going to change now. And it didn't. So, yeah, I mean, what do I know? But I still have hope because I think. I feel we're in a vortex of a spiral toward, towards a negative bottom. So sure. my, my, my hope is that that will somehow disrupt things enough. 
Yeah. You and me both. I mean, that's what this podcast is all about is really trying to expand the conversation beyond just, you know, the blood work and the, what's the latest and greatest hormonal contraceptive and, and all this other stuff. It's like, it's like, as the Titanic is sinking, it's that, it's that band, you know, they're just, tr just like strumming along, trying to keep everybody calm as the thing is sinking and everybody feels it, but nobody knows where to go. We're going. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I, I do think that's true. I really do. Let's switch, um, let's switch, change courses here a little bit. I know you've been studying quite a bit of Tantra and, yeah. uh, why don't you start by talking about, was it called Ista? Is that what you had? Yeah. Before? Talk about how yeah. you had Tantra and how we can might maybe apply this to birth and death. Yes. Um, well, first I'll just share that, um, I, I, I am someone who's a survivor of, of childhood abuse and then teenage, um, sexual assault. So in my part of my pathway in my late teens and early twenties, once I, once I became sexually active was really just trying to figure out like, what do I like and who do I like? And, um, part of that journey gave me exposure to Tantra, um, which was, which was very healing for me. I also studied and, and read books on masochism and sadism, people like George Bataille, Michel Foucault. Like I, I really wanted to learn kind of, you know, what are these concepts of sexuality? What are actually mine? And what have I been indoctrinated with? Oh, yeah. And yeah, so, so that, that has been a personal journey that I've been on. And then in my um, mid late twenties, I um, had a yoga studio back in Manhattan. That was like my home base. And there was a gentleman named D um, Douglas Brooks, who's a Tantra scholar. He did his uh, master's and PhD at Harvard and has published a lot, teaches a lot. And it was really through him that I learned kind of the overall concepts of Tantra, but not any Tantric practices. Um, but just this, these concepts of non-duality that I think Tantra is infused with and, and how the, how one of the beautiful things of Tantra is this finding the divinity in oneself and finding the divinity in carnality and in, in, in excrement, in, in, in whatever it is, that it's all divine. Yeah. And if, if that, at least that to me, I'm not a Tantra scholar, but if, if, for me, if I could share what I have taken away from Tantra, it has been to connect more deeply with my own divinity, my own inner masculine and feminine and releasing a sense of, of duality, of sen a sense of just me as a woman, and leaning into that I'm I'm both masculine and feminine, and and that it's okay to embody that more actually on this planet and in this lifetime and in my partnerships. So I I am someone that has leaned mostly in the direction of 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 heterosexual relationships. And so trying to bring that into the way that I relate to my partners is that, you know, I, like, I am masculine and feminine, and, uh, and I want to be able to play with those dynamics with somebody else. And I think the other thing that I would say that I, that I think Tantra, it has been a gift to my life is this it's actually, it's been a gift to my life and it's the way that I see it parallel actually with death work, which is, which is seeing the divinity in the excrement of life, mm -hmm. like whether that's the literal or the figurative. So I, so I think that's something also that you and I have both experienced as death workers, as a hospice physician and as a hospice nurse and as a, as a death doula of, you know, like giving a bed bath to someone who has soiled themselves and just how deeply divine and beautiful those moments are and that I feel they are and that I am in our intense human connection in those moments. And that's been a gift for me as a death worker. And I, and I feel that Tantra 
allows me to explore. It, it, it teaches me to explore that in other areas of my life. Yeah. 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 I always think about, you know, the, the old couples that are walking hand in hand and they stop and see a really pretty cloud and they look at each other and kiss and then they keep walking, waddling down the street. And you, know, you see a lot of this in like, in like Europe, European countries where my, when my wife and I were in, um, I promise I'm bringing this back to what you said. <laughs> when my wife and I were in Madrid on our last trip to Europe, and this was before kids, so it was several years ago, but um, we're walking around in Madrid and, you know, we've known each other since we were very young. Um, and so you kind of lose that little bit of that like butterfly feeling. It's just natural. People who say it, it doesn't happen are just lying to you. Um, but man, you see these older couples in Madrid at 10 o'clock at night, walking around in a plaza, just sitting there kind of making out once in a while. It's like, gosh, what an incredibly different take on sexuality, um, than we would be led to believe in a society that equates love with sexual performance or activity. Um, so back to what you were saying, I think about the person I, I love so deeply in my life, my wife, what is our love going to look like when we are wiping each other's butts or one of us is dying yeah. earlier than we were hoping? That is that sort of, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Mark Gaffney, but he wrote um, a couple books on Eros. He's a Hebrew mystic, probably definitely definitely in the this this cadre of people that you've been hanging out with. But he uh, he did this master class called the erotic and the holy, and I, I've brought this up several times recently, even in podcast interviews, because it it really is so tremendously powerful when you fall in love and you you get into those like oh god I just want to fuck you I just like let's just tear yes. clothes off and that's awesome we love that that's the level one though that's like again elementary school level love yes and you're fulfilling your entire love requirement with the act of of copulating, <laughs> which yes. is great. That that serves a role. But it, like I said, at some point, you don't have that same passionate experience anymore. And what many of us do is go back and look for another level one experience. But while you're in this level two experience, you also have the option to work through this with the potential of, with the, the right work, the right presence with one another and patience, you can transcend level two into level three. And this is the path of Tantra, where now sexuality does not exhaust love sexuality is a consequence of deep connection and love and that's yeah. i think so deeply lacking in our society where everything is shame and blame and guilt and we're all you know we we all have to like fulfill our sexual desires on you know through pornography and all of this stuff as opposed to first connecting and then the consequence of that connection being some deeply sexual energy Ex yes. being exchanged between two people who are deeply in love. Um, it doesn't, doesn't even have to happen through marriage. I mean, you could have somebody that you're just so deeply connected to. And really every person you connect to, even it could be your mother, your friend, your sister, whatever, there is this pathway where eventually you transcend and you can just sit together and just know that you're in love with one another. Um, mm -hmm. But we're not, we don't really see a lot of that in our in our societies and especially in our work in medicine with all everything we just talked about where there's a it's like the these these important rites of passage are devoid of anything spiritual well there's truly no, yeah truly and and sexual connection sexual union is the ultimate embodiment of of, of a spiritual um what's the word um like true sex, true orgasm is a transcendent experience. It's not just getting your rocks off, I guess is what I'm trying to yeah. say. Yeah. <laughs> it's not just ejaculation yeah. or yes, or having that peak orgasm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and that actually really dovetails so beautifully into the, the, the Tantra retreat. I just was recently on the ISTA retreat. ISTA stands for the Institute of Temple Arts. Um. And that, that is sort of their approach is that first we connect to our own divinity. First, we explore the many ways in which we have this screwed up view of our own bodies, of each other's bodies, of expectations of each other's bodies, screwed up views of 
of sex, of what is sexy, screwed up views of our dynamics with our parents, of of what we wanted and didn't get, and then how we try to manipulate and get that in our in our interpersonal romantic relationships. And then that affects the sex that we're having. So part of what the work was at this retreat was kind of going back to those dynamics with our with our primary tribe, which was our nuclear family. And and what were those dynamics? How can we heal those so that we're not subconsciously yeah. seeking seeking that in romance and in sex? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, in, in Mark Gaffney's language, he would say we exhaust eros through sex as opposed to it being flipped on its head. In other oh, words, your yeah. entire experience with love and connection is through penetrative intercourse, for example. And yeah that that leaves a lot to be desired because you're not in level one anymore. Now you're with a person that you've committed yourself to and that you really want to make it work, but gosh, you just don't get that feeling anymore. Yeah. Am I not attracted to them anymore? Am I not with the right person? They don't love me the way I need to. It's like, man, 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 man. Like, you know, you have to, to be willing to commit to this work. And then if you're willing to commit, just like with any practice, that transcendence to this new experience with Eros, with love is possible. Mm-hmm. Um, Truly, yeah. Where are you go? Where are you going with this tantra practice now? Are you gonna? Is this going to be something you're pursuing further? Um, potentially, I. It's more. I think. I think. More, what I see happening is, um, I in the past like five years taken more trainings, be, working with grief. Uh, which I, you know, which has been a part of my birth work and part of my sure. death work, but I took some formalized trainings with David Kessler, with Paul Dennison, mm-hmm. with um, um, uh, oh, can, I can't believe I'm forgetting his name, but the gentleman that wrote The Wild Edge of Sorrow, whose name I can't, uh, Francis, 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 uh, uh, Francis Weller. Oh, there it is. <laughs> yes, Francis Weller. Yes, and also Stephen Jenkinson and. Um, Megan Devine, and just re- really putting myself back into a, a deeper student mentality and an understanding the many faces of, of grief. And so what I think is happening for me going forward is more working with individuals and working with groups, creating some retreats that are actually around grief, but bringing in some of these tantric principles. So maybe it's like the tantra of grief or grief and tantra, something like that. But that that's that's what I have been feeling calling to me. But I don't, I'm just making it up as I go along. I'm not sure where it's going. Well, if, if this pathway of, of uh, grief is a really important one, because for all of the things that we, we most, uh, the things that provide us the most suffering are those things that also provide grief. And um, our unwillingness to confront grief or to allow grief to enter us and to do the work that grief does that actually ends up, I think, leading to pathology in and of itself. And I think our society as a whole reflects our inability to sit with pain and grieving so much exactly. so that you know, a young person dies. What is the first platitude somebody says? Everything heals with time. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. You never get your mother or your father back or your baby that died in childbirth or your partner or whatever. And it, it, it is something that has to be confronted just like with mortality. Grief is the... Uh, the engine, so to speak, of transformation. We transform when we wrestle with grief. Exactly. Yeah. It's and it's the thing. And I also, you know, I understand like why people don't want to, right? Because grief is that deep abyss. It is yeah. that deep fucking abyss that we all feel. If I start crying over that, if I start feeling that, I'll never be okay. I'll never stop. Crying. I won't make it through. I won't be able to survive this. And so we as a society have these very advanced um, avoidance strategies, you know, and, and we prioritize that as, as a societal norm. We prioritize youth, we prioritize just the ecstasy, winning, the um, money, um, accumulation. And 
in some ways just sort of like these peak experiences. And I, and I, I do feel I actually have, I think like several friends that in some ways I would say are kind of addicted to peak experiences and, and, and it's also become so normative to pursue peak experiences. Right. I think, and I know this isn't what this talk is necessary, this conversation is focused on, but that's, you know, one thing that I see that for me is really scary about this explosion of the psychedelic renaissance is how many people are are seeking that and are pursuing that because they're trying to experience a peak experience, you know, a, a peak moment of emotions. Um, which is a beautiful catalyst. It, it is a beautiful breaking open. But there are also the thing about grief is that grief, grief is like the slow, the slow work. It's the work of whispering to yourself and hearing your own inner whisper. So it's 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 not that the psychedelics don't help with that, or it's not that you know going to Peru and sitting with a a, a beautiful wise shaman isn't going to help you. But the real grief work is this, it's a slow dance. It's a slow journey. And I, 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 I think it's, it's a bit sad for me that there isn't a lot of emphasis on that in our society. And so that's something that I, I have a desire to talk more about and to try to be a leader in if I, if I can. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're actually helping me synthesize some of these ideas, that level one, level two, level three thing that Mark Gaffney described. Really, the reason that level two is so hard, that hard work, is that we're grieving the loss of level one. Oh, and, yeah. and most of our attention is, how can I get that level one back? And again, yes. it's, either, it's either through going back and finding another person. You could go into polyamorous thing. Like, that's fine. For yeah, all getting of into poly, yeah. finding another part. Yeah, totally. Yeah, but it, what's driving that is the grief of not having level one until I do this hard work of level two, in which case my wife and I have great sex. It's level one sex, but we've also had to work for years and years and years and go periods of like months without having sex that we enjoy. Like, so, so this grieving process is it's, it's sort of like you have to reconcile the fact that grief has to become a part of your life. And if you're not willing to work with it, it just leads to more and more suffering through these cyclical maladaptive behaviors. Yeah. Yeah. The grasping, Uh, the, the, the grasping and reaching for what was. Exactly. Yeah. I, I think that in my work, it's most present in the, that after that archetypal transition from mother to queen or empress, or actually more so even from, from queen empress, which is that like post raising kids, but you're now in your like embodied adult woman archetype. After that, of course, we get to the crone and the crone has been discarded by society. So that grieving period that I'm getting older, I'm getting close to that. We just run, like you said, run as fast as we can away with plastic surgery, uh, with um, longevity medicine, which is this bonehead idea that is no different from us saying we're going to fly to Mars and recolonize a new planet. Like your inability to cope with your mortality, which has been kind of the theme of this whole conversation, is leading you to destroy the beautiful architecture that is you all because in this present moment in this present moment yeah so that that grief is very strong it's very very strong i think it's becoming complicated in the the language of hospice because people are becoming abjectly depressed and suicidal as they get older and i don't blame them look we stick old people in nursing facilities and let them rot away because they're not productive anymore you know going back to what you said before so um i think this is important work this is a beautiful synthesis of so many important ideas. Yeah. And you know, the thing that's also ironic about it, and I, I think you and I have um, in some ways in our personal friendship talked about this, is that if we could encourage people to find ways to not grasp for what was, whether that's like the super juiced out sex experience or your friend that just died or family member that just died or who you were before you gave birth, before you entered this new cellular phase and you just actually really, really stayed with this present moment, that there's this strange thing that the deeper you're able to drop vertically into that, 
you actually get the the ecstasy. You 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 actually get the connection to the universe. You you get the common humanity, and you feel more connected and you feel more expansive. But it's weird because, of course, it doesn't look that way at the beginning of the journey. It, you know, it, you feel like if I if I allow myself to touch into all that sadness and all that pain, if I allow myself to go into the the abyss, to go into those dark waters, I'll never make it up. And then my life will just be this like small abyss of sadness. But the reality is that the deeper you allow yourself to go into the abyss of the sorrow and the despair, the loneliness, the ugliness, the aging, all of those things, the more you're, the more you're able to allow yourself to feel those things, to really feel it, then there's this potential of like, I'm connected to everything and yeah. anything. Yeah. I am actually essence. And I'm now connected to the essence of any and everything else that I want to be in this known universe. But it, but you don't know that you're going to get to that at the beginning of the journey. That's like, do you know the work of um, Ken, Ken Wilber and, and integral oh, yeah. theory? Yeah. So he, yeah. so I, un, 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 I, another unusual individual. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Whom I, 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 I revere him so much. I feel like I've, you know, I, I never got to meet him in, in person, but I feel I've learned a lot from him. So I have a deep appreciation for him, yeah. but I, I learned his, his theory or his version of polarity theory, um, which, you know, there's many, um, um, many schools of polarity. So I just want to acknowledge that. But what I learned from him was this concept of kind of the way he teaches it is like, okay, so ask someone, what is their core feeling that that they may be experiencing right now? <clears throat> and maybe it's like deep sadness. And then what would be the exact opposite of that? So maybe it's like extreme joy. And then you talk through, well, what, what are like the pros and the cons? What is the benefit of feeling extreme joy? But also what's the, what's like the shadow side of being an extreme joy? And then the same for deep sorrow. What's the benefit of that? And what's the shadow side of that? And, and once you explore those polarities, it allows you to then have more expansiveness for, for all of that, for the high and the low of, of the extremes on the, on the spectrum. But the other thing that he talks about is that typically if something is a true polarity and this always works, but it has to be a true polarity that you can, you can flip, you can get to the other side. And we've all experienced this, you know, something, someone who has been so ugly becomes beautiful. Something that is so deep and, and sad can it's so deep and sad can become poignant yeah so so i really he's kind of the first one that i feel kind of opened my consciousness to to this concept of like oh wow especially with grief like you can feel so much deep grief and when you're in grief oh fuck it's like it's just your life is small you feel small feel like there's no hope it just that place of deep grief is just awful mm. feeling. It's small. Mm. Life is small. But strangely, when you feel that in the extreme, I mean, my experience and those of the people that I work with one on one and also my friends, I would say that if you're able to allow yourself to really go there, there is strangely this expansiveness that's on the other side of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we tend to see, and you know, I've I've been studying anthroposophic medicine and biogeometry, and my mentor Paul Check speaks quite a bit about this. But he's borrowed, of course, from a lot of authors like Ken Wilber, and even this idea of of like God consciousness is like an infinite. If you imagine like a wave containing an infinite number of amplitudes and, and, and frequencies. I'm not describing this well, but basically God is a flat line. Everything shoo, compresses down to this line, the infinite potential zero and everything that we're experiencing above and below this as, as either a higher frequency or higher amplitude wave, whatever that entire experience can be compressed down into this little thing. And in our real life experience, 
as people on the physical, but also these more subtle energetic levels, these polarities pull us. This, there's this vacillation, this vibration that changes with everything. And if we want to get those highs, to make it as simple as possible, those highs are not possible without the lows. And that sounds cliche, but I'm speaking on a deeply energetic level that the grief actually serves a function. It, you can't just be high all the time. You have to actually have these, these experiences of smallness, of, of weakness, of debility in order to emerge again in, in you know, what often feels like a boomerang shoo, back out into the ether when you break through it, when you've integrated that. But without that, you're just like a straight line. You can't be a straight line because God is a straight line. And you can't wow. be God. <laughs> wow, I've never. I I don't know who that person is, but I love, I love that, and I love how just as I'm listening to you, how much that um relates to just like the concept of samsara, how, and and yeah. how that's that yeah. that's that path that we're on is yeah. these these extremes ups and downs. But I I don't know who that is. That who Paul Paul Check? Yeah. Oh, so he's a mentor of mine. He's he's still alive. He he came out of the physical therapy world, strength and conditioning world, but then he like went beeline towards consciousness and God and the guy can remote view. Um, he's got a great podcast, the Living 4D podcast that you would absolutely love. And anybody out there listening, if you like this show, you'll really like Paul's show because he gets guests like Ken Wilber and that caliber, Rupert Sheldrake and um, oh. Amika Swami. He has those types of guests on and he's Meanwhile, this like 60 year old guy built like a rhino who lifts stones in his backyard, like a walking contradiction. He's an incredible human, but he's a dear friend of mine too. So <laughs> I love walk. I, I feel like I'm a contradiction, a walking contradiction. So oh, I totally love that are. about other people. Yeah, <laughs> you totally are. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, some like kind of also the other thing that I see as being this benefit of cultivating a relationship with grief is um, not, not only kind of if you go through that, how your life expands, but just also how you become softened. And, and I, of course, like the process of softening is, is mm -hmm. painful and humbling, but it's also so rich and wonderful. And, you know, and it's kind of to tie that somewhat in, back into our Tantra conversation, you know, this is something that I'm presently experiencing, but I'm, I have uh, recently met my life partner that I'm, I'm so, I'm just so grateful for him and for our relationship and our connection. But I know that there's no way I would feel this level of gratitude and appreciation for him if I didn't go through right all of the all of my own relationships I'm sorry and 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 deal with my own karma um with relationship and sex before and so it also I think going through those things like lends a sweetness to life that that I'm just so appreciative of you know I which I you know six years ago I would have said like I'm not appreciative of anything I'm just I just feel like I'm not gonna make it or, or survive yeah but now on the other side of it it's like man I'm just I'm blessed hmm. now the, the word reverence comes to mind when you said the word blessed um, it seems like there's this like little spark of divine intervention. That's what blessed feels to me, like to me, where you just get this like, ah, oh, wow, life is so fucking great <laughs> because of X, Y, or Z. And um, I think many, many of us with new cycles and everything else, not to, not, not taking us down that path, but we, 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 we forget that in this incredible blessing, this opportunity to be born and to live on this earth school for however many years we have, whether it's two hours or 200 years, maybe in the future that people are living that long. Um, the point, the point of your life is to, is to rest into ease into this space where you get this incredible opportunity, a blessing to experience all of the human emotions on the full spectrum 
and you can numb those out you can dull those out you can you can do whatever you want to do or you can you know embrace these this opportunity to feel the deepest sorrow and sometimes i think psychedelics actually are the fastest way to that you might see you might feel the absolute deepest pain on the mental emotional spiritual levels on a deep psychedelic journey that you couldn't even possibly have conceived of and then you come out of that you know uh what was it not tom aquinas who who wrote dark dark night of the soul uh well anyways your dark night of the soul could be that very bottom of the pit yeah. and now what does everything how does everything else fit into that with yeah. our new cycles and everything i think we get caught in this like good and bad and right and wrong. And, and there's just so much nonsense out there that has nothing to do with your experience here. And you embody that at that as the experience, but the experience is experiencing this incredible vacillation between the deepest sorrow and this divine spark, this divine intervention, these blessings that creates that polarity is what creates this Nicole Hybrider. That's what it is. You're this walking embodiment of this vacillation between the the great and the not so great. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and in particular, as it relates to love, that you know, there's a famous um, a Shakespeare sonnet that he says, um, "As love is for your crowning, so is it for your pruning." And mm -hmm. and I I I had a lot of I had a lot of samsara and a lot of karma to get through before I could make it to this moment. And I feel appropriately pruned such that I can have reverence for a man like him. Cause I don't, I think if I would have met him six, seven years ago, I, I don't actually, I actually, I'm fairly certain I would not be able to have the appreciation and the reverence for the human being that he is or for the partnership that we've created. Yeah. Yeah, he's like you. He's like he's just he's a unicorn of a human being and a unicorn a unicorn of a man. Um yeah, so that's it ta it takes some kind of internal um slowness in myself to be able to recognize the unicorns in the field. That's right. Thank you for that. If you have a, a unicorn radar that's really finely tuned, you might find yourself very lonely at times because you're just looking for another unicorn. And I know that you're one of them. That's why we can get together and just chat like this for an hour and not even yeah. blink an eye. Um, thank you for being so open and sharing and being vulnerable and just being you. I really appreciate you coming on and giving me some of your time today. I appreciate you so much as well, Nathan. Everything that you're doing and... And also all the, I know you do so much and you're, you're doing a bit more with the end of life, but just all the midwives and doulas that you support. And just as an OB physician, I have deep reverence and respect for that because I know it's, yeah, you're, you're carving out your own path. Very much so. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, yeah. If people want to reach out or work with you, I know you're still offering courses. How can they find you? Yeah. Yeah, um, the best place is to go to my website, gracefulfusion.com. Um, just it it is how it it's it's, it's spelled how it sounds, gracefulfusion.com. And um, in this moment, I teach birth doula trainings and I teach end of life doula trainings. And I'm working on an offering that I will launch in 2023. That's called the End of Life for Dysfunctional Families. That mm. um, that that really is meant to be a supportive offering for those of us that come from a family with addiction and deep mental health issues. And um, yeah, and, and, and then how those things can erupt at the end of life. And there's not a lot of books or literature or support on that. That yeah. was something when I was first starting as a hospice nurse, um, the, the company that hired me didn't do a whole lot of training. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to have to read books to, to educate myself. And when I was reading those books, you know, even books from, you know, like Roshi Joan Halifax and Frank Ossieski, like these like really smart, yeah. brilliant, wise people. But if you read their books, a lot of what they're even saying is like, use this as an opportunity to have these deep 
conversations with your family members. And I, I know for myself that that actually is a somewhat dangerous proposition. Sure. They're really what I need and what other people like me might need is more work on boundaries, boundaries of time, boundaries of the soul and the spirit and redefining the ways that we might show up with our family that right. don't leave us re-wounding ourselves as we were wounded as a child. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're right. That is definitely not something in our textbook training. That's something that's no. gained through experience. And perhaps there are people out there who get it, who can actually yeah. mentor those of us out there who are lost and looking for better resources. So yeah. thank you, Nicole. We'll send everybody your way. I'll put your Instagram mm -hmm. and all of that in there. But um, you said your, your website again, one more time. Gracefulfusion.com. Gracefulfusion.com. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Love you. I love you too.